Okay, so I'm going to be talking about scaling high throughput analysis, and I say biological data analysis because I'm a biologist, a computational biologist, and so we've been uh, doing this for a few years, and I'm going to try and talk about it from that perspective. Um, to understand how we do that, it's important to understand how biology has changed and how we've changed with it. Um, as Cofactor has grown, we've had to scale up our data analysis approaches. Uh, and so I'll talk about the lessons we learned along the way and, and really about how to scale effectively when dealing with uh, large scale biological data analysis. So modern genomics really began with the Human Genome Project. Uh, Washington University in St. Louis was one of the two institutions that was leading that effort. Uh, and I went there in 1998 to be part of it. Uh, if you don't know much about the Human Genome Project, it's really this combination of technology and talented people uh, working together to gain uh, tremendous insight in, into humans. And so uh, there were thousands of biologists uh, hundreds of programmers and, and technologists uh, all around the world, a multi, really truly multidisciplinary team that went into that process. And for me, it was the first time I'd really experienced the practice of biology at scale. So starting out in, in school, it was about one gene at a time. And really at this point, we're looking at all the genes at the time and really across multiple, multiple organisms at a time. So this project to understand the book of life, our DNA, uh, which encodes all that we know to be human, uh, one of the things that you may not know about the Human Genome Project is that it was a largely a manual process. So this was state of the art in 1998. Uh, this is what sequencing looked like uh, when I joined the Human Genome Project. Um, what you do and I'll show a picture of this in a second, is you'd pour a thin layer of gelatin, a very special gelatin, between two sheets of glass. Uh, DNA is negatively charged, and so if you apply a current uh, to it, then it will flow down the gel, and, and you could use a laser uh, to read the DNA off the bottom as it was flowing by. Um, so this is the top of the gel over here uh, on, the, uh, on the left, and you can see uh, that there's a reservoir there, and so think of it like a battery, right? Um, so if you were really good, you could load 96 lanes of DNA across the top here, 96 wells, and um, and on the on the right, you can see what these fluorescently labeled uh, DNA molecules look like once imaged on a computer. So there were four colors, one for each of the four letters uh, that encode DNA, and so. 96 reactions on a single gel. You'd get about, you could read about 700 letters of DNA per reaction. And so per run, you could get about 67,000 letters of DNA. Well, the human genome is about 3.3 billion letters of DNA. And so that takes about 50,000 of those gels uh, to, uh, to, to, to read it once. And it's a little bit more complicated than that because uh, this is a sampling problem and there are errors. And so you really need to read it about 30 times uh, to get an accurate uh, read of it. And so, so you multiply that out and that's about 300 gels per day over 13 years. And that's partly why the Human Genome Project took so long and why it cost $3 billion. When we get to 2008, so this is about seven years after the first draft of the human genome was published in 2001, um, really around 2005 to 2008, there started to be a real change in the technology, the underlying technology that we use to sequence these molecules. Um, so by that point, a massively parallel uh, sequencing technology had taken hold. And so what had taken thousands of people a decade to complete at $3 billion could now be done in a day with one machine for thousands of dollars. So the joke in, in our lab became, wow, you know, with one of these new machines, uh, 
now all it takes is three guys to be a genome center. And that was a joke for about a year. Uh, and over that time, we started to see people come to visit from all sorts of different industries and, and research entities who wanted to take advantage of this new technology. And the large research institutes weren't really set up to serve that customer base. And so we realized that this might be the beginning of a new market. And so in 2008, we became those three guys in a garage and, uh, and so Cofactor was founded. So it was three scientists form, formerly from the Human Genome Project. Uh, we had one sequencer uh, that cost us about half a million dollars. Uh, our CEO had to take out a second mortgage on his house and, uh, and credit card debt. And we raised a couple hundred grand from friends and family. And we went on Craigslist and rented a, uh, a 700 square foot photo studio uh, for about $700 a month. That was one of our largest expenses at the time. And after a few months of work, we were able to convert this photo studio into what became a laboratory housing one of the first companies really uh, at the time to, to do next generation sequencing based uh, sequencing on a commercial basis. And as I mentioned, there were a lot of different people who were interested in, in accessing this technology. So we worked on everything from agriculture to biofuels, small academic projects, uh, to drug development. And this is really, we were, we were all things to all people at that time. And we realized that the two things kind of came out of the process of working with all these different industries. So one, that doesn't really scale. Uh, being so broad in your application uh, didn't allow you to be a, a, a good solution for any one of those, e even at this early stage in the market. So uh, we realized that we really needed to focus and where we wanted to focus uh, was in the upper right there in, in drug development uh, and, uh, and what eventually we, we call, now call personalized medicine. The other thing we learned is that uh, although we had focused our whole career on DNA, uh, what we found was that working on RNA, a related molecule, is actually where we needed to be uh, to, to really make an impact in personalized medicine. And there was one other funny thing that happened along the way. Uh, we sequenced the DNA of Ozzy Osbourne. So one of the more interesting side projects, uh, I'm happy to talk more about it later, um, a much different kind of personal genomics, if you will. So RNA versus DNA. So as I mentioned, we've been working for a long time with DNA. And we came to realize that about 95% of the diseases uh, cannot actually be diagnosed looking at DNA. And the reason for that is that DNA, the blueprint of life, doesn't really change over, over the course of your lifetime. So the DNA that you start with, that you have at birth, is the same DNA pretty much that you have today, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, RNA, on the other hand, you can think of as the more active form of DNA, uh, changes all the time. And it's present in every cell in your body, uh, and it changes in response to your diet, to exercise, to infection, and what's most relevant for us uh, in relation to disease or, or the presence of disease. And so for this reason, DNA, although it's the blueprint of life, it's a fixed blueprint. Uh, whereas RNA is a barometer or can be used as a barometer for your health. And so we can analyze changes in your RNA uh, to see early signs of disease before your doctor uh, can with, with what is now the conventional, conventional techniques. So fast forward to today, uh, Cofactor has nine of the largest pharmaceutical companies under contract. Um, that initial investment um, has generated millions of dollars in revenue. We've had uh, a very successful grant uh, uh, process uh, raising uh, uh, research money from the NIH. Uh, our 700 square foot uh, photo studio is uh, now a, a 10,000 square foot custom facility. Uh, we uh, were backed by Y Combinator last July uh, which is one of the largest early stage investment companies. Um, 
out of Silicon Valley that have invested in Airbnb and Dropbox and Stripe. And well, we were able to raise a, a seed funding round on the back of that. Uh, uh, last month, we acquired a, another small genomics company out of San Francisco to further our push into uh, genetics and molecular diagnostics, and, and we're pursuing a Series A now. So, and, and most of that happened really in the last 12 months. So, so how did we get there? And how did we scale to keep up with, with the, the flood of data? So going back to, to this, the change in, in the, the rate of change in, in this business. So uh, most of you are familiar with Moore's Law, as Steve mentioned at the top. Um, this rate of change has been faster than Moore's Law uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, so from 2001, at the finish of the Human Genome Project, it cost around $5,500 uh, to generate about a million letters in raw DNA sequence, to read a, a, a million letters of, of DNA sequence. When the new massively parallel sequencing technology uh, came on in the 2008 timeframe, you can see, whoops, you can see a, a, a pretty steep drop across orders of magnitude there uh, in, in the cost per base. And then even continuing now to today in 2015, where the raw cost of reading a million letters of, of DNA sequence is less than a stick of gum. So as this change happened, uh, biologists had to learn how to use computers, really, is, is, is a lot of what happened. And so in terms of the the amount of data we're talking about to try to give you some context for that. So a single machine today, we will uh, get about 150 billion letters of DNA. Um, that's about double the, what we were getting last year. Um, that's uh, in terms of MP3s, it's about 100 days worth of music. Um, and really in biological terms, that means we can sequence about 40, the equivalent of 45 human genomes in a single day today. So this meant that we had to learn pretty quickly how to scale our ability to analyze this data. So generating it is one thing, but it, the whole reason we're all here today is because the, the computation that we have to perform on that has to scale pretty rapidly too. So this is the data transformation process for this kind of data. So over here on the left, you'll see um, a magnified image of the actual uh, sequencing platform. So this is one end of a microscope slide. And each of these individual little dots is a, uh, a sequencing reaction happening. There are about a billion and a half of these going on across the microscope slide. Uh, magnified here, you can see in this 20 micron section, uh, there are four colors, again, uh, one for each of the uh, uh, letters of DNA. And, but as opposed to the previous version where it's, it's 96 at a time, now you have billions at a time, and these are all being looked at simultaneously. There is a, uh, a carefully controlled chemical reaction happening in each one of those dots that is reading the, the growing strand of DNA. Uh, there's a very sensitive camera attached to a microscope which takes pictures of those reactions. It needs to keep track of each individual spot and, and what the uh, position is and converting that into then a, uh, a, a, a fragment of DNA sequence uh, in, a, uh, in a computer. And that uh, transformation process then eventually through image processing and cluster analysis uh, will create a, uh, just a long string, really just a, a text string uh, one, one for each cluster. Once we get to letters, the actual A's, G's, C's, and T's in a, in a text file, um, there's still plenty of work to be done. So here, starting at the top, here's an, a, an example of one of those fragments. We map that to the human genome sequence. Uh, we know something about where genes are on the human genome sequence, but we still have to assemble, merge, and filter all of those individual fragments uh, back into a representation of a gene. So there are 
And then we were able to count how many copies, say, of, of a gene there are in a particular cell that you're interested in looking at. So there are multiple different types of analysis and multiple analytical steps in this process. So really, uh, another way to put it is that the challenge of, of analyzing this type of data is that you're chopping these genes up into little pieces uh, in the laboratory to be able to sequence them, to be able to put them onto one of these machines. Despite the, the scale, um, most of these machines can only uh, read fragments of about 150 to 200 letters of DNA at a time. And there's some more specialized machines that are coming online that allow you to read into the uh, low tens of thousands, um, but those cost uh, significantly more uh, to read per letter than this mainstream technology. And then you've got this mixture of pieces, and you don't know which piece came from which gene, and you have to put all those pieces back together to reconstruct um, what's going on in the cell. Uh, sequencing is fundamentally, uh, these days, a sampling problem. Um, as most of you know, it is easy to miss some things when you're sampling and undersample. Uh, there are biological challenges as, as well. So the fact that some parts of the genes are shared and can't easily be distinguished from one another. Uh, think of uh, string matching, where you have a large shared pieces of strings. And the sequencing process itself is also imperfect. So uh, there is a, an error rate. It's relatively small, but it is present, certainly, when you're uh, working at the scale. And so that has to be detected and mitigated also. So all of these make for challenges in analytics, uh, challenges in the computations we have to perform uh, to do the analysis, and ultimately, then, challenges in the scaling. So this graph I've got here is one of the solutions that we've looked at to, to try to get a handle on, on, on the data that's coming off these machines. We call it a saturation curve. So this is nothing particularly fancy, but as you can see, you've got, so this is a, a number of sequence reads on the, uh, on the X here. So how much data we're generating uh, out of a given uh, cell. And then here is the discovery rate of new genes or, or unique genes. So as we sequence more, we, uh, we find more and more of the genes that we're looking for. But at some point, those tend to plateau out. And so even though sequencing, is a, uh, sequencing DNA is incredibly cost effective today, there still is a real cost to it. And so you have to optimize where on this curve you want to be. So to, to, you, can't really find, you can't really get to all the data without oversampling out here. And so you try to kind of find a spot on the curve where you've maximized um, the amount of discovery you're going to get um, while balancing that with the cost of the, uh, the running the experiment. So for all these reasons, uh, I'd like to share with you some of the lessons that we learned in, in, in going from this three-man bootstrapped operation handling a couple of hundred samples a year uh, to now where we're processing several thousand uh, DNA samples like this a year. Uh, so first lesson for us was really to solve for the key bottleneck in the process. So sequence data like this is largely, the computation is largely input output disk bound. Uh, so you really need to choose the appropriate architecture for that. And this may sound obvious, but at the time, a lot of our competitors uh, were singing the praises of other cloud providers, um, which were making a big splash, but they didn't really have compute resources that were the right configuration to do this work efficiently. They were all CPU optimized. And so we realized pretty quickly that that wasn't cost effective for us um, and, and, and really just not an efficient compute. And so finding the right architecture with fast interconnects was critical. And that was really one of the things that, uh, that was a clear strength at Nimbix. Um, most of the common cloud providers, at least at that point, uh, didn't have the HPT expertise, HPC expertise um, to, uh, to think in those terms. Uh, we also learned to experiment a lot about the process. So things were changing pretty quickly, and, and the amount of data we were process, processing was changing pretty quickly. And, and so in order to find the right solution, it really helped to take a broad view 
and examine lots of different possibilities. So um, at the beginning, it was pretty straightforward, right? As a small company with one sequencer, we could buy commodity hardware, pretty much hook it up directly to the, um, the output of the, the sequencer and, uh, and analyze that. As we grew though, uh, we began to generate a lot more data and we needed to do a lot more complex analyses as well, um, more than our commodity computer could keep up with. Um, for instance, we had a computation where uh, it wasn't easily parallelizable and we needed about a terabyte of RAM uh, to, to fit the whole thing in memory. Uh, and at that time, anyway, a few years ago, it wasn't readily, that, that kind of machine wasn't readily available. And it's not so outrageous today, but at the time we were looking at, uh, you know, $60,000 investment on just the memory, just the RAM uh, to build that machine. And that's not something that uh, we were prepared to do. So one thing that we tried uh, was FPGAs, uh, Conde, uh, here um, had built a machine and actually done the work to port over uh, some of the key algorithms for this kind of work. And, and that worked really well, actually. And, and so we were able to uh, rent, rent time on, on the Convey machine uh, at Nimbix and were able to solve those problems relatively efficiently um, where we had not been able to provide a, find a solution elsewhere. Uh, two things happened, though. So one... Uh, somebody made a significant improvement in one of those key algorithms, which reduced the memory requirement from about a terabyte uh, to more like 200 gigabytes. And so much more tractable. And, and we had a machine um, that could handle that pretty easily. Um, two, however, an entirely new algorithm was developed uh, that was invented really to solve the same problem, but in an entirely different way. And so it wasn't too long after that that... Uh, that in fact another major improvement was made to that new algorithm and and that process has continued to happen so in this era um, we're still seeing such rapid algorithmic development that the investment in in porting that over and optimizing that for for the fpga um, really didn't make sense to us at the time now, today that might be different. And actually, based on what Steve is talking about, I am actually really interested in exploring the possibility of, of a more automated uh, approach to that, where we maybe can keep up with the algorithmic development and take advantage of, of our hardware approach. Um, but at the, at the time, um, that wasn't true. And, and even though this particular experiment was, was valid or, or helped us only for a short period, um, it was a good thing and, and really taught us um, the value of exploring different options, particularly different computational options um, that have had greater traction in other industries, um, whereas biology, which is relatively new uh, to high-performance computing, has not. As we started to build more complex applications around compute-intensive al algorithms, um, we started to build longer and longer chains of those uh, and, and greater and greater pipelines. So the good news is that most of this type of uh, computation is embarrassingly parallel. And so we could just throw hardware at it and it would work really well. Um, but what we found is that there was still high variability in the execution times depending on the, the, the unit of work and the, the input material. And it's not too surprising if you think about uh, a string, uh, a, a biological string of, of DNA is not actually random, right? And so uh, if you have, for instance, an, a, an area that's highly repetitive, string matching, that kind of thing is going to take a lot longer than a, than a much more random or much more unique type of string. And so depending on the makeup of the particular molecule, you have high variability in execution time. So while there's nothing inherently wrong with, with building longer pipelines, uh, it meant we had larger chunks of code to maintain. and and as I mentioned, the key algorithms were changing really rapidly. And so for us, you know, we had, using you know, standard practices, you know, began to modularize our code. Um, but what we realized is actually that there was a huge benefit in, mo in, in modularizing our executable queues as well. And so really building the smallest unit possible for each of the, the different steps in this large analytic chain. Um, we really just kind of fell back on the old Unix idiom of, of you know, one tool for one job. 
Um, we'd been used to thinking about that in terms of the, the software that we wrote, but not really in terms of our execution queue and our, our actually our, our use of the hardware. And so once we made that switch and, and had much more atomic units of execution, then everything flowed a lot better. It was possible for each each step in the chain to be queued independently, to write its data off, to uh, to share its storage and shut itself down, and then the next step in the chain could pick up uh, and, and do its work. Uh, so that's just from a, a purely computational point, but also it became a lot easier for us to maintain, of course. So you know, really being enabled by um, by good robust APIs like uh, like the Jarvis 2.0. Um, on the operation, on the the execution side, um, as well as how we maintained our code on uh, on our side, on the application side. So similarly, we found that using the simplest solution possible um, paid great dividends for us. So this is a problem I hope few of you have had. Uh, in our case, as we began to scale on the sequencing side and and bring on more capacity there. We were generating a lot more data over a relatively short period of time, and we ran into an issue uh, where we found that we could not obtain good network infrastructure in our location uh, with a high upload speed um, without it being really cost prohibitive. Um, so to give you a sense of that, it would have cost us about $10,000 a month for a 100 megabit per second connection, um, and, and plus a long and punitive contract on top of that. Right, so that just wasn't an option for us uh, three or four years ago. Um, and so we really had to find another way to be able to get that data from the sequencers in our lab into a cloud computing facility. And we explored several options. Um, we realized that as dumb as it seems, overnighting a hard drive, uh, and even if we were doing that once or twice a week, uh, was faster and cheaper by a large margin and more robust actually too, than a lot of the other options we were considering. Uh, so we definitely didn't love the clunkiness and the analog nature of this solution. Uh, we had to do very careful checksumming uh, on every read and write because of the amount of, of that that had to be done. Um, and actually we had to find a provider that was willing to put up with us and, uh, and be able to load that data um, that they you know, got on a, an external hard drive in a relatively short period of time. Many providers provide that service, but it's often uh, a highly variable and long uh, process till that actually gets uploaded. And for us, you know, we had customers waiting on this analysis and we didn't wanna be waiting longer for the data to be loaded than it took us to actually analyze it. Um, and so it worked. It, you know, it, the, it meant that the computational side of our operation could keep up with the laboratory side, and we could continue to grow. We could continue to scale, and it it freed us up to work on some of the more interesting and challenging problems. Um, you know, really understanding the biology of, of some of these diseases. And so, thankfully, now we have a, a nice and fast fiber connection. This is no longer a problem. Uh, but at the time, this was a simple uh, but but effective uh, solution. Another thing that we learned along the way is how important it is to have a good partner. Uh, so I think, and I, I and echoing actually sounds like what some of Paul realized also is that really having a world class service is is underrated um, because we were always moving to solve the next bottleneck in our process. Uh, that meant that we were moving closer and closer to the edge of of our core expertise, and we realized that. To be able to do what we needed to do, we, we had to be able to partner with people who had complementary strengths to solve our problems. So I'm sure uh, Steve and Rob and Leo are a little embarrassed to have their pictures up here, but um, really they have been tremendous partners for us. Um, being able to get a quick response to our problems, uh, whether it's a trouble ticket or a phone call, um, made the difference often for us in, in being able to solve a problem quickly and move on. Uh, being able to discuss a, a more difficult problem at length with, with people who had the right expertise. So um, Steve, Rob, and Leo are those guys for us, and, and I'm sure everybody who's worked, worked with them has had a similar experience. So that is a, an overview of both a change in the industry 
a, a change in how our business has scaled uh, with the addition of, of uh, much more data than we started out dealing with. Um, we found that that these steps of, of looking at your or the, the area where you can make the most impact uh, first is important while still leaving yourself time to experiment and do research and development. Um, we found that loosely coupling um, at the right level, both uh, on the application side and on the execution side, made a huge difference in our ability to change with the change in the uh, in in what was state of the art. And using the simplest solution uh, and really optimizing as late as possible meant that our human time um, could be managed a lot more effectively and letting the computers do um, do most of the work. And really, part of that was focusing on our strengths. And, and being able to build the strong partnerships that we needed for everything else. Um, I think that is a, a key piece to scaling that we don't off, think about often enough. So for us, this is what our results looked like over the last few years. So in early 2014, it would take us about a week to generate data for a typical size uh, project with one of our farmer partners. It would take us twice as long um, to do the compute for that. Uh, today, uh, we've been able to reverse that trend almost completely, where now, even though we're generating a lot more data in a week than we did two years ago, we get still average project size has grown, and so a week of data generation. But now we can do uh, all the computation for that in just a couple of days, usually. Um, and that's with much more data uh, than we were using before. And by the way, we do that with just two full-time engineers um, working on the analytical side. So solving the scaling problem for us also had an unexpected side effect. Uh, and that is that once we were at scale, we were able to experiment more and iterate faster and try new things. Um, a lot of the things that we had used actually to get to scale. Um, and we saw this virtuous cycle really develop, this feedback loop that allowed us to continue to stay ahead of the curve and, and actually have time to, to think about what the next step should be and what, what would be the best strategy for us instead of simply uh, playing catch up and, and trying to keep up with, uh, with the the, the rate of data that we were generating. So I would argue that solving a scaling problem produces not just a difference in the degree of, of your, or the speed in which you work, but it actually produces a difference in kind. It allows you to, to operate in a, in a, on a, in a different way um, than you might've expected. So the three, uh, three guys in a garage are now uh, 19. Uh, this is most of them, and uh, thank you for listening. Dave, thank you very much. Great presentation. I uh, love sweater there in the in the picture. <laughs> yeah, it was um, from our holiday party. <laughs> he was really uh, feeling it. <laughs> so we actually have a few minutes uh, for you know whatever questions anybody has, and just raise your hand and let me know. Don't be shy. All right. So <clears throat> I know one of the challenges with dealing with uh, sequencing is not just getting the sequences to assemble, but being sure that you got a meaningful and correct assembly. So I was curious how you're talking about divvying up the, the processing elements and the you know sort of breaking a project down into smaller pieces. How would you split the computing resources between you know, assembly versus sort of ground truthing, making sure you get it, the parts to assemble correctly, especially around the repeats and so on. Like, what was your your prioritization strategy? Uh, right. Thank you for that question. Actually, that that is one of the things that we spent an awful lot of time and still spend an awful lot of time thinking about. And so, the quality control aspect of this turned out to be a really important uh, for our pharmaceutical partners. And so we devoted a lot of resources to building out that section in an area which, uh, while becoming more common today, certainly wasn't initially. And so 
Uh, I would say that we spend as least as at least as much time uh, in the compute phase and actually on our development time in coming up with better and better ways to um, to perform those kinds of checks. So one thing that we do is is have a uh, an internal control, a molecular control um, that we can track from the very start of the process all the way through to the end, and we can get a readout. And, and we know the particular mixture of molecules that, that we spiked in and a small fraction of the total and can watch that those, uh, and we know the relative ratios of those. And so we can see that those ratios come out at the end. Um, we do uh, statistics as well on the distribution of, of quality that you might see. So you can, you have an estimate of the, the correctness of every single letter of DNA that you have. We also try to move that also to the level of having an estimate of the correctness of the mapping of a particular chunk of DNA to a particular gene or, or segment of the, the genome. And, uh, and then we also have been doing trend analysis, right? So um, we do, we, we look at every project individually and see that the metrics stand up and, and, and meet the right criteria. But what we found is that now that we have all this data, it's really great to be able to look at it over time, even across different projects, to be able to see uh, whether there are uh, potential performance issues developing in the hardware uh, or, uh, or even on our laboratory side. And so that kind of ability to, to do mass statistics and, and, and trend reporting over, over time has been uh, critical for us. Yeah. I think we'll let Steve go last there for other people a chance. So as part of your scale out statement, you said one of the biggest things you've learned is what your strengths are and where you need partners. So in the scope of taking a gene or somebody's DNA sample, RNA sample, transcriptome sample, whatever it is, from beginning to an actual medicine stage, where do you see your strengths are? And where would you be looking to partner? I mean, I know today you're talking about computation because that's the point sure. of the summit. But is that where your strength is, or do you feel your strength is on the sweet sequencing and then post analysis? So, we, as I mentioned at the beginning, we were really doing all things to all people, and we focused the last few years on RNA um, because of its. We believe it has great potential, not only for sort of uh, uh, ex, ex, gene expression analysis, um, but also to develop diagnostics around. So. What we've tried to do is build on our expertise, helping other companies build their diagnostics and therapeutics and, 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 and launch our own research program where we're developing our own molecular diagnostics. What we're finding is that now the frontier for us is one on finding the right patient samples. So if we want to make a clear statement about how what, what are the fingerprints in a particular uh, constellation of RNA that our clear marker for that disease, uh, or early stages of that disease. Um, we need, we've been partnering with people who have, who really are, are area domain experts in, in, in that particular disease. Um, and then the other piece is really understanding how our clinical and pharma partners can best make use of this type of information. So um, we've been having lots of conversations with them and trying to find the right stage in their process. And what we believe today is that it's really in the, so we've been doing lots of work with them on the R&D and discovery side, right? And so, but now as we move into the clinical side, it's the phase one and phase two parts of clinical trials that um, turn out to be really fruitful, we think. So in phase one, we can look at lots and lots of genetic information about their patient population retrospectively to see that uh, the people that they, uh, they looked at may have some common element or, or common signature. <clears throat> we can then use that information to help them look prospectively at their phase two patients to be able to qualify somebody in or out of that phase two trial. And so, uh, so that kind of information is something that we, we would not have known about even six months ago. And so that kind of thing, really, really looking at the Helping, you know, we're, we're expertise in this technology, we're expertise in, in looking at RNA and, and developing signatures off of it, and we're trying to, to reach out to partners who are going to be um, the, the first stage, the early adopters for that. 
Go ahead, Steve. Great. Actually, you sort of answered my question um, along the RNA you know, side of things. I, I guess I would just follow on and, and maybe you could comment on where you see, like if you were, you, you know, you showed the charts kind of looking in the incredible evolution in such a short amount of time, where, where you see that going over, say, the next five years, what, what does that look like? And how are, is the ecosystem, whether it's, you know, for uh, drug discovery or therapies or uh, whatever, what, maybe what does that look like? And how is it enabled by the work that you guys are doing? Sure. So one thing I'll say is that, you know, even though computers are relatively new to biology, and by relatively new, I mean, really, it's been 20 years, but that's, you know, my degree in computational biology, my PhD is not actually, doesn't say computational biology on it, right? It still says theoretical biochemistry because they don't think of it as, as, as a new thing yet. So you'll see more and more sophistication, I think, as, as the demands of the data require uh, better solutions. And so I think that's a sweet spot in the market right now. But really, I guess if I could ask you to think a little bit more broadly about how computers have changed the world over the last 30 years. To think about what a computer looked like in, in 1980, 1986 and, and what it looks like today. So that kind of change and the impact that that change has had on really every aspect of our life is what we will see biology doing over the next 30 years. So right now, is, you know, one could say we're about 1986 in computers uh, in, in biology today. And so think about Think about the iPhone. So you, you all remember that the iPhone didn't exist eight years ago. And that's, that's not a long time and it's had a tremendous impact. It's granted, it's, it's, you know, mobile's at the mature end of the computing curve, one could say, or more mature end, but, but this is how, how broadly uh, I see biology is, is having an impact on really every aspect of, of our lives. Um, so, uh, Actually, I have a kind of a, a different kind of question where um, in, a, in a lot of times when you have uh, some sort of computation, for example, you know, 3D rendering, the, the uh, output is sort of self-evident. You can see that, oh, it's of high quality, right? It's realistic. Uh, in, in genomics, it seems as though there's this uh, tension between advancing the state of the art, advancing speed, uh, trying to get as much analytics and extracting as much insights as possible using the best computational methods. And then on the other side, this, this idea that, oh, I don't really trust you because, you know, maybe your result is not even biologically viable. Like prove to me that it's even correct, right? So it seems as though both from an algorithm point of view and also using like the best methods or the best hardware, uh, just advancing the computational aspect is really hard uh, because you have to have that credibility. How do you, how do you solve that problem? This is a huge problem, and, and we're seeing more and more of this as we move into the clinical side. And it makes sense, right? Because if we start to make decisions about patient care and about treatment, we want to be as sure as it is possible to be. Uh, at the same time, when we see such a seismic shift in our ability to use biological information with the aid of computers, um, we have to uh, take that, you know, we have to try to take advantage of that as, as well as we can, but albeit in a safe way. So the way that we approach this is to try to build a chain of, of uh, reliability or, or, or uh, certainty uh, at each step of the phase. And so I talked a little bit about the quality control efforts that we take really from the moment that a, a sample arrives in our lab all the way through to, um, to um, in, into the computational side. Uh, as we start to analyze the data, uh, and develop methods around that, it's important to refer back to what is the state of the art and what is the gold standard for that. So, um, uh, so one example would be um, trying to, uh, to look at gene fusions which are um, relevant to a cancer. So um, in breast cancer, is a common case where a, a chromosome rearranges and you have one piece of one gene fused to another piece of another gene and it causes, uh, causes uh, that disease. The gold standard method for doing this is to um, smear DNA out on a microscope slide um, with fluorescent stains um, that, uh, and probes that will uh, detect that particular rearrangement. Um, this is a completely analog process. Um, we are trying to replace that with a sequencing-based approach where um, we can detect that fusion um, purely computationally. 
Um, in order to do so, we have to measure up against the gold standard and show that we have are as good as as the uh, the old fashioned analog microscope smear. And actually, we are starting to see that we can do better and detect fusions that that method cannot. You think about the limits of, you know. Having some fluorescent molecule that has to be able to find its its partner and has to be glow brightly enough to be able to see see that and it's not at all a, a digital resolution like we can get with with computers and so um, that's the way we approach it is we we try to be able to show that we're not we're as good as what people accept as the gold standard and then try to move beyond that um, but you're right it's not easy and people, and they're with such a uh, a rate of change in the algorithm development. Um, we have to stay, at least for the clinical applications, on the a little bit further on the back side of that curve. Um, but that's, I think, that's entirely appropriate. We can keep the R and D, the early adoption stuff, on the front end. So, I, I know you spend a lot of time. You did for a while using uh, the computer technology. Now I think you've you've uh, offloaded that uh, that part. But I, I wonder for the uh, the database technology is just changed enormously, I think, over the last uh, generation. And how much effort have you put into just how you manage your, your data, your catalogs of data, and maybe what type of technologies are you using for that now? So the short answer is not enough. Uh, we are we are looking at two things. So one is that uh, a couple of years ago, the typical endpoint of our, our project with a with a, st a study that we did with a, a, a customer would be to uh, represent the the, the data in a, um, a a web app um, that would allow them to easily search and 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 uh, and filter the data. Um, and this is not particularly complicated database. Um, it's it's really pretty flat um, from an architecture point of view. However, there's a lot of data in there. It's you know, on the order of a million million rows is not atypical. Um, by today's database standards, that's not huge um, by any means, but we were definitely lagging behind um, in, in getting that up to snuff. So we, we tried to make improvements on that side by, um, we looked at some of the kind of uh, big table type stuff and depending on the application that worked in some cases and in others, others it didn't, um, depending on the type. So those aren't, at least in my experience, and I'm by no means an expert at this, those aren't great at uh, um, multi-level uh, querying and filtering. So as soon as you have a joint, what's essentially a join uh, or multiple joints, it, it, it bogs down. Um, so that's on that side. The other thing that we're actually really excited about doing is doing large databases where we can take not just one study's worth of data um, and analyze it and, and cross-reference it, but we really want to be able to do that across all the data. So all of the, the cases for a particular cancer type, we want to be able to look at all of them at once. We, may, we want to be able to build a, a, a signature, an RNA signature off of those. And then we want to be able to search that, right? And so you know, think about reducing a RNA signature to a computable vector. Um, and that's something we're spending a lot of time on. And, and we've brought on expertise to, um, to really push, uh, push in that direction. But um, we're... If you have any good suggestions or ideas, I'd love to talk because we we are, are certainly still in the exploratory phase on that. Last question. We're over a few minutes. So I'll follow up with that. And I'm working with other companies on genomics, so I have some experience. But when you start doing that large multi-project analysis, one big thing in the way is HIPAA, basically, right? Um, it doesn't get more personal than your DNA, and there's no way to take the personality out of it. <laughs> it it's you. It'll always be you, and I can tell it's you. Um, how do you deal with that as you're doing multi-person analysis across different projects? Um, and then the other problem is the golden reference. Right now, your reference is the person that did the human genome products. Everybody uses that as the reference, right? I can't compare that against some South African. It's going to be very different. So how do you deal with that problem? Okay, so... Uh... Two parts to that. So if I'll take the first part last. So the genome reference actually is not one person. It's, it's, a, it's a melange of seven people. Uh, and it is outdated. The good news is that we're sequencing thousands of those um, and public research is doing this. So we now have thousands of, of examples of, of completely sequenced human genomes. They're not done to the same standard. Um, and they're, in essence, assuming that the, 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 the original one was largely correct as far as the gross structure of it. But 
Um, we're getting enough data on that. I think hopefully that problem will be solved. It ultimately doesn't matter as long as we are always comparing everything to the same underlying reference. And so you can think of it like a map, right? Even if your map is wrong, if you're if you're measuring distance to things um, on this, everyone's using the same wrong map. It's it's it actually turns out to be okay. Um, as far as the HIPAA. So for those of you who don't know, HIPAA uh, means that we have to protect um, personal data, privacy, you know, per, uh, patient privacy data. Um, this is something we have to take very seriously. We're actually in the process of, of having our lab accredited to be a clinical laboratory. Uh, and so, and I've been leading up that effort. And so, so the short answer is that as long as you, none of that information has identifiable data, um, it's okay. Uh, and as long as you're not exposing that um, to, you know, as long as it's sort of uh, in a uh, an encrypted and, and secure environment, it's okay. Um, I think you might be alluding to the fact that there have been some efforts to figure out who the person is based on their DNA. Um, we are not typically looking at their entire genome. We tend to be looking at um, just a, a set of genes under one condition. I'm a little bit skeptical of the ability today for that to be a problem, um, although I, I wouldn't be surprised if I turned out to be wrong about that very soon. Um, but, as, but as long as it, we, we de-identify all the data coming in, so we actually deliberately um, don't know whose data belongs to one. So as long as there's no outside connection, so that it, you know, there'd have to be a, a database of, of somebody's genetic information with their name out there. We'd have to try to match it up for that. That resource doesn't exist, and we're not creating it. So thanks very much. Dave, thank you so much.